If Metroid Dread does anything well out of the gate, it's conditioning the player according to what they need to know. The game puts the player in situations where they are given an opportunity to learn and then immediately put into practice gameplay elements that are essential for progression later. These elements of Metroid Dread's game design as a whole are inseparably linked to level, mechanical, visual, and sound designs, so we'll get into those later. On a deeper level of design, however, 2D Metroid games are speedrunners games. Always have been. And Metroid Dread is no different. The game is designed in such a way to make certain routes or paths seemingly impossible, either because the area ends in a dead end or because you don't have the correct tools to traverse that part of the world yet. But that's just what Mercury Steam wants you to think. Dread has been made not only with the understanding that people are going to try to break the game, but it's been designed with sequence breaks in mind. This mindfulness is demonstrated most obviously during the Kraid fight, which is convenient for me, since it's the one big fight in the game I can talk about without actually being a spoiler. Hidden in Kraid's boss room is a bomb block in the bottom right-hand corner. Breaking it will reveal a launcher that can shunt Samus into the glowing hole in Kraid's stomach, providing the player with a unique way to insta-kill the boss. This scenario can only play out if the player has done several sequence breaks before finding Kraid, wherein you have to get the grapple beam early, use the grapple beam to break out of Diaron's Emmy zone early, and then restore power to the West Laboratory, which then allows the player to get the Morph Ball bomb early. The breaks only snowball from there, as you can get access to Berenia early, which means you gain access to even more abilities earlier than seemingly intended. It's one thing for these skips and breaks to be theoretically possible, but it's entirely another for Mercury's team to have found them, designed around them, and then reward the player for excelling in their exploration and gameplay skill to the point where they can actually pull them off. Alright, let's get some of the very few negatives out of the way immediately. Loading zones and unintuitive destructible walls. The loading screens, to be fair, look great. It's good that it isn't just a loading icon in the bottom corner of the screen. The elevator one in particular looks like it's a callback to a similar loading screen in Metroid Prime. However, there are some rare circumstances where you're going to travel to a new area for the first time, but you won't actually have what you need to progress and you have to go back. This is good from the standpoint of a Metroidvania design philosophy, but it does result in the player having to go between multiple loading screens back to back, which tends to murder the pacing. Next, there are entire sections of the game that are hidden behind breakable blocks that you have no way of knowing are there. One stands out beyond any others, and it's when you leave the very first Emmy zone after getting the spider climb. The last time that you were able to be in this room, you never had a chance to see or shoot those blocks, and now they are essential. Dumb. Bad. Moving on. This problem gets mitigated if entirely done away with once you acquire the Aeon Burst ability, which you can even sequence break to get much earlier. Also, to the game's credit, shooting dead ends usually works. But just because it works, doesn't make it intuitive. Now let's talk about what Metroid Dread's level design does right. A lot right. The game does something important in that it manages to have nearly a dozen different areas that all look and feel distinct from one another while believably still being on the same planet and constructed or industrialized by the same people. Areas, unique. World, cohesive. Traversal fluid? Yes. Except for the loading screens between levels. The level of detail put into the level design and dread is staggering, to say the least. Each area has been built meticulously to not only accommodate the player based upon what they are expected to have at their disposal when they show up for the first time, but also based on what the player will eventually unlock in both that area and others on return visits. Not to mention the mental gymnastics that must have been at play to design levels with sequence breaking not only being expected, but also deliberately planned for. The level design is also one of the best educational tools used to teach the player how to progress in the game. Anytime a new fundamental gameplay element is introduced, the world around you is designed in such a way that you will learn that new skill and then immediately put it into practice. For example, you learn how to aim, what breakable blocks look like, how to clamber, and how to wall jump. Then you are put in a position where in order to move forward you need to aim, shoot a breakable block, jump to clamber to a ledge, and then repeat the process in order to wall jump from wall to wall and get up to a higher ledge. Likewise, shortly after being taught to counter, you'll encounter several enemies in the world that have more telegraphed attacks and don't deal much damage. This allows you to practice what you just learned on everything in your way without punishing you too much for failure. This is then added upon when you encounter the damaged Emmy for the first time and you're shown that you can counter them as well. This becomes one of your most invaluable survival tools, as it's the only way to deal with an enemy that will otherwise insta-kill you when it finds you. In Dread, 
Mercury Steam has managed to advance level design to such a degree that it goes beyond having levels to beat and a world to build, as the levels themselves become puzzles and challenges to be overcome, whether those challenges be a test of bomb jumping, shine spark marathons, or breaking the game on purpose. In my playthroughs of Dread, I never experienced any glitches that I can recall or see in footage. It does, however, lose a tick for stability, though, because the game certainly does seem to be testing the limits of the Switch's hardware, and the frame rate can stutter or drop at certain points. The mechanics of Metroid Dread are extremely tight and polished by necessity. They are so intimately tied to the level design that they are essentially inseparable and create a chicken and the egg scenario. Which came first? Was the world designed with your precise jump arcs, slide distances, and ability upgrades in mind? Or were those abilities made in order to best traverse the world that was created in the first place? As mentioned earlier, the level design of the game teaches the player how to use its unique mechanics, and rewards players who master those mechanics as quickly as possible. But where the level design informs the player on how to use its mechanics, the mechanical design of the game informs the player on how to progress. This kind of design philosophy is key to any good Metroidvania game. You'll find an object in the world that you can't interact with yet because you lack the necessary tools or skills, and so you make a mental note, or a literal note if you use the stamps on the map, on what and where that was. Then, when you find the things that let you progress, you remember all of those times that it stopped you, and then the world suddenly opens up. When you get the Morph Ball, you'll recall all of those single block areas that you couldn't slide through. When you get the Various Suit, you remember all of those times you died trying to explore areas with lava, and the list goes on. And beyond simply applying the mechanics in the obvious ways that they are intended, like the examples I just mentioned, mastery of those mechanics truly opens up the world to the player, and the imagination of what is possible. Oh my gosh, we got it. We got it! <laughs> yes! Metroid Dread takes the story in one of the only logical paths forward after the end of Fusion, exploring the fact that Samus is theoretically the only living thing with Metroid DNA. This being the main impetus for why the game even happens in the first place. Ravenbeak leaks an image of the X parasite in order to lure in Samus, who happens to be the only one immune to the X because of said Metroid DNA, to investigate, and then attempts to either harvest her DNA or make her join him by force. This also leads to its most natural conclusion by having Samus awaken some degree of Metroid powers. This game also has a uniquely good thing going for it, the fact that it is only one of two Metroid games in the series, with a very, very good reason for Samus to have lost all of her prior game's abilities. She lost a duel with the one who made her suit, and he removed all of the functionality. Unfortunately, however, the game also has a rather paradoxical show-don't-tell problem. Despite it being a game that conveys so much to the player through the visuals and level design, it has a nasty habit of giving massive exposition dumps. The game also struggles, on rare occasion, with its theming. The theming being, obviously, dread. While the actual gameplay does a lot of work to make the player feel that titular sense of dread, specifically anytime you enter an Emmy room, and especially when entering the last two, it also makes the rookie mistake of constantly telling the player how they're supposed to feel. Except your helplessness. It's implied immediately prior to the final fight with Ravenbeak that he had taken over Adam's transmissions and that he was actually the one talking to you for an unknown period of the game. This would make sense as a mode of psychological warfare, constantly demeaning and belittling Samus in off-handed ways to make her feel less powerful or confident in her own survival. This also does come to a cathartic end when Samus finally catches on and destroys the transmission in defiance, affirming her internal character. This does not, however, nullify the fact that you, the player, are essentially being told, 
Hey, you're supposed to feel hopeless. Do you feel hopeless yet? Over and over and over. You were no match for him then. You are no match for him now. You would not be a worthy adversary for him, not even at full power. I estimate a 99% probability of death if an enemy captures you. Your only option now is to evade capture and find an exit. You have no means to confront them. Remember that. The game foreshadows important areas of the map and even bosses in advance without any sort of audio logs, reading materials, or cutscene, literally just in the backgrounds as discovered by the player. The visual and sound design contribute most highly to how the game communicates the situation of world building to the player, especially in the case of the bosses. For example, Corpius can be seen cloaking in the background several times before you actually fight it. In the lower portions of Cataris, Kraid can be heard roaring louder and louder as you get closer to his boss room. There are even Chozo warriors that can be seen running ahead of you in the background in later areas in order to head you off. Also, because it feels very weird to not address the bosses that cover the box art, while the Emmy aren't particularly scary in their physical design, the constant beeping reminds you that they're always there and always looking for you, and it does very much add to that feeling of dread the moment you enter one of their areas. Okay, okay. The game's kind of short. Am I kind of short? I mean, it it's just a short game. I'll confess, it doesn't feel like a short game while you're playing it. But the fact remains that you're going to be done quickly if you're a decent player and you don't get stuck. On my first run of Metroid Dread, I 100%ed the game. Even doing literally everything the game had to offer, I finished it in under 11 hours. And yeah, of course I played more and did a few speedrun attempts, so I got my money's worth. But, for anyone that's just getting into Metroid and isn't a diehard with the need to go back and play it multiple times, it's entirely possible that you're going to beat this game in between 8 and 10 hours, which is a bit subpar for a $60 game. I think... I think I have a problem. Every time that I go back and play it, I get better and pull off more and more nutty stuff, and I think like, Dude, I'm, I'm a god! This game's so sick! But then I beat it and I'm just like, eh, it's alright. I don't really feel like playing it again. Like, I I'll, I'll, I'll be admiring how intentionally and intelligently the levels were designed, and how the level design both teaches and foreshadows stuff, and then I think, well, why would you make those blocks destructible now and, like, not tell me? Like, why is that one spider wall slide down to, like, reveal a door and it wasn't there before or that I, I didn't know was there? And I'm just progressing on accident, you know? High, low, high, low, high, li I, I, Is Metroid Dread just teaching me the fundamentals of manic bipolar disorder? <laughs> uh, but, like, I don't know. Looking back on it, it's rare that I've gotten so frustrated with a game. And not only look back going like, yeah, it's a good game, but, like, dude, this game is sick. Like, okay, full disclosure, 10 out of 10, would recommend. Go buy it, please, support this thing. Uh, but also, frick the dire on Emmy in particular, that thing sucks. Like, you threatened to make a game with awesome movement, great design, important lore, and a game that canonized Samus's final smash, which I have waited 16 years for. Okay, I said 16 and then I fact-checked it. 19. Fusion came out in 2002. People born in 2002 have already graduated high school. I'm so ancient. Unfun. Do you have any idea how hard that is to do? But enough about me. Is the game actually good? Thank you guys so much for watching, and man, having a new Metroid game is kind of trippy, huh? Like, an actually new one. No remakes. Maybe one day Prime 4 is going to get out of development hell too. And you can find me here when it does. Have a good night.